All right, welcome to part two of our biotech uh, video PowerPoint, PowerPoint video. Uh, first part, part one, we were looking at biotechnological tools. And in this, we're looking at the techniques that we can use uh, those tools to perform. Please keep in mind, this is not a comprehensive list. Rather, it's a list of some more common applications uh, for the tools and new things are being learned all the time. Maybe one of you will come up with some amazing technique. One of the ideas that I was hinting at in the last uh, video is the idea of uh, recombinant DNA technology. This is the idea that we can combine different, uh, different pieces of DNA from possibly from different critters completely like bacteria and human. Um, and we can use some of those <coughs> molecular tools we were talking about to, uh, to help us do that. So an example of that we're seeing in our uh, graphic here. Uh, we've got some foreign DNA, for example, in, uh, in blue and pink. Uh, perhaps it's some kind of, uh, or some piece of human um, DNA. And the pink part is the protein of interest. So let's say this was the protein for the uh, human growth hormone. Um, in this case, we're using EcoR1 as our restriction enzyme, and we see we're cutting it on both sides. And we're not cutting it right at the end of that particular um, gene sequence. We're giving a little room. We want to have a little wiggle room here, make sure we don't um, cut off part of the <coughs> DNA that's actually going to code for the protein of interest. So we're slicing the uh, DNA using EcoR1 and what we end up with is um, a piece of DNA with a gene of interest in it and sticky ends that are going to be easy for us to put into our plasmid. So the plasmid, just like we looked at in um, part one of this video, plasmid is a small circular piece of DNA originally found in bacteria that we now engineer um, quite a bit in the lab, uh, put them together for our purposes. So in this particular case, um, the plasmid is being opened using EcoR1 so that the sticky ends created in the plasmid match up with the sticky ends created in the um, extraction of the gene of interest from the foreign DNA, this, and again in this case maybe the human growth hormone, <coughs> because they have matching sticky ends, the DNA is going to um, anneal in some cases. Now keep in mind here, we would be cutting, or at least maybe not cutting uh, multiple uh, copies, but we would be at least making multiple copies of the gene of interest. <coughs> and we would have many, many, many plasmids. And by combining those two things, so making sure that they're in the same um, uh, comfortable solution, if you will, um, a certain percentage of the um, pieces of DNA with the gene of interest are going to anneal with a certain number of the cut plasmids. And what we're going to have is some plasmids that have incorporated this new piece of DNA. And you can see this recombined DNA plasmid um, down sort of at the bottom here where we've got the mostly black and green but we've got a little bit of uh, blue and pink uh, including the gene of interest um, in this um, in this newly recombined um, plasmid then using um, the technique we just looked at for uh, bio for transfer uh, transformation in the lab where we use the calcium chloride and the zero degrees and then the warm uh, flooding of materials into the bacteria, we can cause the bacteria to become competent and take the plasmid up. Then we can let the plasmid grow a little bit and reproduce. And if it has taken up the bacteria, um, quite, or sorry, taken up the plasmid, we can um, screen by using some kind of petri dish with a um, with an antibiotic on it. And there's, um, let's say that this green portion of our plasmid is our antibiotic resistant gene and any bacteria that's taken it up is going to have that resistance. So we can screen for the bacteria that have taken up the gene of interest. So that is, uh, in a nutshell, recombinant DNA technology. So um, again, to recap, um, DNA comes from more than one source. That's why it's recombinant, meaning we recombine DNA that wasn't originally there. We cut out the gene of interest using restriction enzymes and um, 
hope that or well put it put them in a situation where some portion of the gene of interest will anneal to the sticky ends of the plasmid that we're using ligase can be used and I didn't mention that earlier but ligase can be used to um, uh, to restick the phosphodiester linkages and After the plasmids are recombined, they're introduced into the host cell by transformation, which we talked about a little bit earlier with the uh, calcium chloride and uh, re reducing temperature and then the increased temperature to cause that sweeping of the plasmid into the now competent bacterial cell because we've physically and chemically frozen their um, uh, cell wall. And then we put them into these bacteria into a growth medium. So we can see that here in this picture. It was not part of the picture we just saw. And um, because the medium has antibiotics, like again, after we've let them grow in a comfortable environment, we want to screen them. So uh, we can see here that the plated medium is going to have an antibiotic in it. And if the if the plasmid's been taken up by the bacteria, it should be able to protect itself. And the ones that did not take up the plasmid of interest, that plasmid with the gene of interest on it, um, are going to die off. So we can harvest the uh, kind of bacteria that we wanted, the one that took up the recombinant DNA, and we can uh, let that grow and harness the protein that we are looking for. Again, you can watch this video. I will post it on D2L. Um, also, you can get it from the, uh, uh, from the St. Mary website where the uh, regular version of this PowerPoint can be found. All right. Now, I mentioned that possibly we might want to make multiple copies of a particular area of DNA. In the case we just looked at, maybe if we had a gene of interest and we wanted to make many, many copies so that we could introduce those um, messages into a into many, many plasmids, right? So we can ensure some success for ourselves. Uh, PCR is basically the, um, the process by which, the technique by which we can make many copies of a particularly, uh, you know, like a, a, an area of interest. So not necessarily a huge area, certainly not the whole genome, but uh, one area of interest, we can make many, many copies of it so that we can use those copies to do lots of different things. So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction and uh, we've got a series of steps that we're going to use to as I say here amplify um, DNA think of it as a photocopier for DNA so we're using uh, what we know about the process of replication to make many many copies of our uh, DNA and again there's a video same idea I'll post it on D2L and uh, if you don't want to go there you can go to the St. Mary website and link directly in. Okay so um, PCR is uh, a method again if if there's a small piece of interest that you need to have amplified we can't do this with with a whole genome um, or with a large piece of DNA. But if we had maybe a small sample of blood at a crime scene and we didn't get a very good sample, a very good DNA read on it, we could use a piece of that to make um, multiple copies so that we can run lots of different tests, maybe a, a fingerprinting like we saw in our previous, uh, um, in our part one of this PowerPoint. All right, so as I said, it's a pretty quick process. Um, in sort of 20 generations, you can produce millions of copies. So uh, in a few hours, you've got lots and lots of DNA to work with. And there's a particular set of steps uh, that can be taken. And again, um, there's a TED Talk link, so another one for me to put up. Um, okay, so step one, we're going to heat our DNA. That's our original DNA, so the piece at the top um, where we've got a red strip and an orange strip. Keep in mind, they're not identical, but they're pair bonded. So, um, you know, if there's an A on one side, there's a T on the other and so on. When we heat the DNA to about 95 degrees, double-stranded DNA separates. This 95 degrees causes the hydrogen bonds to break. We will then take the DNA and we will um, cool it and add a special DNA primers. So we have to know a little bit about the sequence we're working with. Um, 
annealing to the three prime end of the fragment to be amplified. So kind of like we had in replication. Remember we had primers that came in and then uh, DNA polymerase could come in and build the other side of the piece of DNA of um, you know, that we were trying to replicate in that particular uh, portion of the genome. So we're going to do the same thing here. We've gone up to 95 degrees, then we cool down to about 55 degrees, still above body temperature. Um, and we'll allow the primers to anneal to the three prime ends. So those primers have been specifically engineered to stick. And in our graphic, we can see we've got a green one for the red side, and we've got a uh, fuchsia one for the uh, orangey yellow side. <coughs> and in both cases, they're annealing to the three prime Yeah, the DNA sample is then heated to uh, 72 degrees, so heated back up again. And in order for DNA to be built, we need some polymerase in there. And I did mention this when we were talking about polymerase and replication originally. Um, we use the TAC polymerase from Thermos aquatis, which is a bacteria that lives in um, hot springs. Uh, so it's used to operating, its proteins are able to uh, maintain their structure at higher temperatures. So, so we don't have to cool the DNA back down to uh, body temperature. We are going to use this TAC polymerase. It's a DNA polymerase and it adds <coughs> the nucleotides just like um, we would expect in replication. So we can see in this test tube, we've got our DNA, we've got a whole bunch of free nucleotides. So um, we'd have a nucleotide with adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. We've got our TAC polymerase, an enzyme, and we've got some primers. So we can actually build a complementary strand. So the, um, so the DNA polymerase is let to do its work and build a new side. Uh, from five prime to three prime. Remember, we can only build new DNA five prime to three prime, and then we do it all over again. So then we'll split these, use them as templates, and go through again. So once we've got uh, multiple copies of the DNA from PCR, we can do lots of things with them. Um, one process that doesn't require just a small piece of DNA that we might be able to use in PCR, rather um, we can do from large samples of DNA is uh, one of the techniques we can use as a way of doing DNA fingerprinting. This is more of a, I don't know, it's more of a sort of a, the original way of doing um, DNA fingerprinting, RFLP. So uh, restriction, uh, restriction fragment length polymorphism is the acronym. And basically what would happen is that, <coughs> again, we're trying to create a, a visual fingerprint um, based on strands of DNA so that we can eliminate suspects or tell parentage or something like that. So it's quite a lengthy process. First thing that we will do is we'll take the DNA sample and we'll digest it with certain restriction enzymes. And um, that's what we're seeing, a mess of DNA at the top of this diagram. They're being treated with certain restriction endonucleases so that we can have fragmented pieces of DNA. And then the fragmented pieces of DNA are run on a gel. Now on this gel, you're not seeing those nice bands that we saw in the gel from uh, PowerPoint number one. What we're seeing is a big smudge. And the reason for that is we've got so much DNA there that we can't actually differentiate. Um, so what we need to do is, uh, is sort of do a few um, more steps and um, try to filter out some useful information from that. So the smear is not what we need. We have a few more steps that we that we must take because we started with so much DNA. And you guys saw with your own DNA extraction um, in the cells that you All right, and this is what a finished um, RFLP DNA fingerprint should look like, and that's obviously not what we had so far. <clears throat> and there's another YouTube video for you to watch. The gel is, uh, okay, so once we've got that single strip, what happens is that the um, gel that was made with the smear, the smeary gel, if you will, is placed on a nylon membrane and it's immersed in a solution, a denaturing solution, um, which is going to um, change the way that the DNA is um, wound around histone proteins. 
and we get single-stranded DNA uh, from this, and single strands of DNA are able to migrate from the gel onto this nylon membrane using a current. So we're using positive and negatives, not unlike what we did before with gel electrophoresis. The process where the DNA transfers from the gel to the nylon membrane is called southern blotting, and there's a bit about it in your textbook you might want to read. The membrane itself, that nylon membrane, has been soaked in solution that carries uh, complementary probes. So we can target specific sequences with these complementary probes. So they have base pairs that will match up to particular things that we're looking for. So maybe we're looking for a particular genetic condition that a person might have, and we would engineer a probe that would match up with that location. Um, so say something like um, cystic fibrosis. There'd be a probe that would match up with the uh, either correct sequence or incorrect sequence and um, by knowing that the probe showed up or didn't show up in further processing we would know if the uh, mutation was uh, found on a particular part of the genome. The probes are radioactive, which means we're going to be able to expose them later on x-ray paper and actually be able to read them. So <clears throat> As mentioned, the membrane, once the probes anneal, the membrane is placed against an X-ray film and developed into something called an autoradiogram, which is what we're seeing in our diagram on this slide. <coughs> There's a more recent, um, more effective uh, process of DNA fingerprinting that's being used um, more frequently now, which involves short tandem repeats. So a little bit different than using that whole big blob of DNA in the previous uh, RFLP. Um, <clears throat> so the short tandem repeat um, analysis, uh, um, we're also using samples from uh, maybe crime scene or for parents of, uh, or potential parents of an offspring and so on. Um, certain regions of the DNA are extracted. So we're actually only dealing with a small, well, much smaller portion of the DNA. Um, points that we know are going to be different between individuals or have a certain amount of similarity amongst individuals that might be, um, that might be related. Or regions that are easy for, uh, again, for a crime scene, um, investigation, something like that, areas that we would be able to match up with uh, samples that were collected from, you know, from crime scenes. So these pieces that, um, that we've cut out of the um, crime scene data or, you know, whatever the DNA is that we're working with are amplified by PCR, which is a process we already looked at. So they're basically photocopied so that we have lots and lots and lots of copies of them. And then uh, we can go ahead and use these in a gel electrophoresis and we can find out how many repeats of a particular area and we're going to or, or we may have already looked at the idea that we have um, non-coding regions where we tend to get a certain number of repeats that are unique to individuals. Um, so we're looking for that, those kinds of markers here. How many repeats of a particular sequence does an individual have? It's a unique sequence and therefore <clears throat> if it matches, um, you know, something, uh, something that we're investigating, it's, uh, it's, um, it gives us a, a, a conclusive information that it's the individual that we're, that we're looking for. Or again, if it's something like paternity, we can tell that they, um, by how many repeats um, are similar, we can tell. These pieces are dyed either by fluorescent dyes or by other kinds of staining that make the DNA visible for us. And um, again, the, the regions that are uh, amplified and tested are, um, are ones that are standard amongst individuals that we would use to set up DNA fingerprinting. Say if, if you know, say Canada decided to fingerprint all of its citizens, um, there would be 13 locations, loci, on the genome that we would use so that we had a combination of information that would be unique to each individual in our country. So 13 different locations on the genome are tested. Right, another technique that we can use uh, for um, 
you know, for different purposes, maybe for figuring out um, the, or the way that this process was first used was to figure out a uh, critter's complete genome sequence. So exactly where all the A's and T's and C's and G's are located in what order in what critter on what chromosomes. Um, so the method we're going to look at right now is one of our DNA sequencing methods and it was used by one of the uh, groups in the race to uh, completely sequence the human genome, which I know you guys are um, haven't been around long enough for that to have been a big deal. Um, but for about 10 years of our um, scientific history, um, there was this race to finally map the human genome. And it was done basically at the same time by two different companies using two different methods. So the Sanger dye deoxy method um, is kind of uh, kind of neat, uh, very simple and uh, straightforward. And again, in this case, we're mimicking the process of DNA replication. So think back to what you know about DNA replication. Um, what happens is, uh, or what we do in this particular method, is create a set of um, nucleotide analogs. So if we have a look here, we see that we've got a 5-carbon sugar, pentose sugar, we've got a base, and we've got three phosphate groups that are attached, not unlike a, an ATP. <coughs> and because of the structure of the sugar molecule here instead of being able to act as a nucleotide that can be joined onto because remember we're trying to join from the uh, through five prime and three prime um, because of the structure of the sugar here we can't actually add the next nucleotide so if this gets incorporated into making a new strand of DNA it will be added into the DNA but no other nucleotide can be added to the other end so in essence it stops the um, replication process from happening um, so, uh, in this process, first thing that happens is the DNA is treated so it becomes single-stranded. Uh, primers are added, kind of like in PCR, primers are added to, <coughs> to the end of the DNA and uh, strands, uh, the strands are, these prime strands are added to um, four different kinds of reaction tubes. And in these reaction tubes, we have basically the same material. So here's a visual of those containers, and we can see uh, the orange container is the container that uh, has the original DNA sequence with the primers. It has lots of regular adenine nucleotides, thymine nucleotides, guanine nucleotides, and cytosine nucleotides. And then in this container, we also have that uh, analog we were just looking at, the di deoxy analog for adenine. So some of the adenine, but not all, just a little bit of it, some of the adenine is not um, uh, normal, a normal nucleotide. Some of these nucleotides have that um, that change in the sugar that will end replication. In the next one over, we've got the green test tube. We can see just, again, we're going to have exactly the same stuff in there. We're going to have our original DNA. We're going to have lots of regular nucleotides, A, T, C, and G. And we're going to have primers. We're going to have, oh, and I forgot to say um, DNA polymerase in the test tubes as well. In this test tube, however, instead of having a little bit of the uh, manipulated adenine uh, nucleotides, we're going to have some of the manipulated cytosine nucleotides. So all normal A's, all normal T's, all normal G's, mostly normal C's, and a few of these manipulated C's. And same then for the G tube and the D tube. The same thing in all of them except for um, a little bit of this modified um, nucleotide. So again, each tube has polymerase, they have lots of free nucleotides, and each of the four tubes have a different radioactively labeled dideoxy analog at low concentration. Um, again, because of this uh, three prime issue where we've got a, you know, a, a configuration change in the sugar, polymerase, DNA polymerase cannot add onto the three prime end. So remember they can only build five prime to three prime and if they can't add anything on the next uh, five prime, it's not going to be able to uh, continue uh, being replicated. Great, here's another visual of the process. Again, we can see the denatured DNA at the top. Um, 
popped in their different containers and in depending on which container we have different kinds of replication that can occur on the template strand. And any time that we have a dideoxy analog added in, we're going to have the end of replication. So we're going to get strands that are shorter than the whole template would allow. Once we've done this, and we'll talk more about this in class, so don't worry if you didn't quite catch all that. Once we've done that, we can run this on these um, uh, these fragments, these pieces that we've grown, we can run them on gel and because of the radioactive label we can actually see what length the different strands are. So really in essence what we're doing is showing where we've added an analog and cut off or stop the um, the replication. So we can see where that happened in the strand by looking at how far this strand has migrated. Another, and I think our last uh, topic here, is the idea of gene therapy. And when we first started talking about gene therapy in uh, genetics, it was supposed to be the um, end-all, cure-all for all things um, genetically related. And we're finding that that's not, not been the case. And probably our understanding isn't great enough to really have been able to, um, to go very far with this. So the idea is that we can insert genes into a specific kind of cell or tissue in order to combat or treat a disease. Um, still working on the idea, but again, hasn't been all that successful so far um, for, uh, for people, um, mostly because so many of our diseases are affecting so many different cells in so many different ways, and um, also, like, so multicellular issues, and also, um, it's very difficult to uh, make the patch, deliver it to the right cells, have it penetrate in and actually um, incorporate itself into our genome at the right location. So it's an extremely tricky thing. Um, how do we deliver the correction and ensure that it's going to become incorporated and used rather than the original mutated DNA that causes whatever the condition might be? So the idea is that um, we can remove cells from the patient, we can alter the genome and, um, and construct some kind of vector, some kind of like injection device, if you will. In this case, they're talking about using a virus. Um, so alter the virus so that it contains the fix and have the virus um, basically attack our cells and instead of injecting their own genome, they're injecting the fix into the cell, but there's no guarantee that that's going to become incorporated into the genome and work. It could make things worse. Um, it's a very tricky, very, um, you know, it's very hard to be specific enough to deliver what's needed to the right location. So again, has, imp has proved to be very difficult and um, even though we're still investigating this as a way to combat disease, we haven't really been very... Uh All right, so there's the end to our intro. Um, hopefully you'll be able to grab some, uh, some information out of that and come to class with lots and lots of questions.